Hi, Franco Cavallari coming to you from Biologic to talk more in this insulin part two session about insulin resistance. Part one, we talked about how some mutations can contribute to insulin resistance. And these are genetically inherited mutations that we have little control over. However, as I mentioned, the majority of people with insulin resistance and or type 2 diabetes, the majority are in this state because of lifestyle and, and the chosen dietary habits associated with that lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle and a lifestyle that includes dietary choices that are processed and high glycemic index, high in carbohydrate, and so on. Let me explain something. In the first part, we talked about the development of insulin resistance and pre-diabetic states of insulin resistance affect the metabolism in a way that makes it difficult for you to lose weight and manage body fat, including managing lean body mass and optimizing it. So as we said, as insulin resistance progresses to a level that's extremely high, it is then um, going to move to states called clinically diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And you could be at the edge of type 2 diabetes, meaning your fasting glucose, when you test it with a glucometer, can exceed 6. 5.5 is kind of like the edge. Fasting glucose of about 5.5 millimoles in the morning is indicative of you moving towards a type 2 diabetic state. It should be anywhere between 4.5 and, and 5. And then when it gets to 6, 7, 8 is bad. So, the point is that your lifestyle will contribute to the escalation and development of this insulin resistance, and you can change the lifestyle. Most people who have adult onset diet type 2 diabetes um, are dealing with it not at all because of mutation. Don't lean on mutations because there's very few people. It's probably between 10 and 12, 15% of the people with type 2 diabetes are dealing with a mutation. The rest is lifestyle induced. And if you're dealing with a mutation, the lifestyle is going to exacerbate or make it even worse. So you can put that back in control. How? Physical activity, which increases lean body mass and improves clearance of blood sugar independent of insulin signal. So if you're developing insulin resistance, when you get engaged in physical activity and deplete glycogen of the muscle mass, what happens is the body then needs to restore that glycogen, restore the tissues and blood sugar is cleared independent of insulin signal, right? So physical activity helps to maintain um, a better state of insulin and then watching your diet so that it's higher in protein and fat than it is in carbohydrate and combining fat and protein with carbohydrate sources so that you reduce the glycemic impact of that food. How do we support healing or correction of insulin resistance in addition to changing the lifestyle? This is what we studied and built thermobutyrate on. Thermobutyrate improves insulin function and blood sugar clearance. Thermobutyrate improves the breakdown of body fat by activating hormone sensitive lipase. And it improves uncoupling protein activity and brown fat activity. So it helps burn fat and helps you get into the groove and the momentum of removing body fat and improving insulin function and blood sugar clearance. That's how thermobutyrate works in that context. So it can help break the cycle. It can help you control your appetite and then get into the groove of improving insulin resistance. You may have a type 2 diabetic state and in due time when you're measuring your fasting blood sugar, you'll see that that fasting blood sugar level will come down over time as you progress through the physical activity on a regular basis, improve dietary habits that remove processed carbohydrates and high glycemic index carbs from the diet, and taking your thermobutyrate on a daily basis. How does this relate then to fasting? In particular, intermittent fasting, because this is what I've been asked. The intermittent fasting is a formidable way to cope with and in fact even treat a type two diabetic condition. Intermittent fasting, entails stopping your intake of food anywhere. It, it depends on who you're talking to and what you're trying to achieve. You know, 7, 8, 9, 10 p.m. Most people, it's around 6 or 7 p.m., the last meal. And then you fast, obviously, through the night and while you sleep. This is why breakfast is called break 
fast, breakfast, breaking the fast during sleep. While you sleep, your body actually produces ketones. And when you wake up, you're in a fasted state where the brain is using ketones as a, as a source of energy. And if you maintain that fasted state to 10, 11, 12, and for some people, 1 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon for a longer period of time, you induce a cascade of restoration a restoration of the uh, in the body that activates sirtuin proteins, autophagy, and things like that. However, however, there are certain things that happen within the cells. I'm not going to go into the details that require longer longer states of fasting, like 48 hours, 72 hours, to induce significant restorative effects, including autophagy, which may be in, in the range of 30 to 40 hours for some people. It depends how you've trained your body and your metabolism uh, over time. Some people respond better to intermittent fasting than others. And it is proposed and uh, indicative of some data in the research that those who respond better to intermittent fasting in terms of their cognitive clearance, in terms of physical energy, their capacity to function throughout the day, those who respond better are usually those who are in advanced insulin resistant states. Because with an insulin resistant state, when you consume your carbohydrate and full meal in the morning to break the fast, now the body has to rely on insulin to propel energy, make energy from your food substrates, like make ATP. So fasting is not for everyone, but it's good to fast occasionally to induce restorative activity throughout the body. But intermittent fasting on a regular basis is not for everyone. Those who have optimally functioning insulin activity don't necessarily feel that great in a fasted state. That's me. And if I'm physically active and burning calories and working out in the morning and working out in the afternoon, a fasted state or intermittent fasting takes me offline because it depletes my glycogen. I need more food. I need more glycogen when I'm training more regularly. But as insulin resistance progresses in my life, if it does over time, intermittent fasting would become something I do on a regular basis. I do it occasionally.